Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our virtual public meeting uh, with relation to the Kinsel Trestle Gateway project. Thank you to everyone who has turned out this evening. Uh, on March the 2nd, beautiful sunny day, a little bit of rainy, but mostly beautiful on the Cowichan Valley. I want to start by acknowledging that we're coming from various parts of the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. We're all very happy to be gathered here. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'd like to first introduce the staff that we have uh, on the call or the, the meeting today. Um, leading the presentation this evening, we have Brian Farquhar, our manager of Parks and Trails for the CVRD. We also have Megan Walker from the Parks and Trails Division with us. We have Ann Gerolf, who is the general manager of land use services at the CVRD. We also, as panelists, have our chair of our board, Lori Yanni DiNardo, and the director of Area B, Shawnigan Lake, Sierra Acton. So thank you all. I also want to acknowledge that we have some, uh, other, some of our directors from our board also in attendance this, this evening. I see we have uh, Allison Nicholson, uh, director of Area E. We have Ben Martman, dir director of Area H. Klaus Kuhn, director of Area I. Ian Morrison, Director of Area F, Lynn Smith, Director of Area G, and Mike Wilson, direct, Director of Area C. So thank you all for being in attendance this evening. And approximately 50 or 45 or so uh, members of the public at this moment. So thank you again all for joining us. Before we get into the presentation, I just wanted to give an overview of how this evening session will go. Uh, so we'll begin with the presentation from Parks and Trails about this project. And the goal is to provide as much information as possible in terms of the history of uh, you know, the Kinsel Trestle, the access points, um, the potentials for um, access points that have been considered up to this point and, uh, and the kind of rationale for the current project as proposed. Uh, following the presentation will be an opportunity for questions um, and answers. And I, for those who haven't joined one of our virtual meetings in the past, I wanna give you a little housekeeping. If you are uh, joining us from a device, you'll notice on the right-hand side, you'll see the Q&A function. Um, within there, that's where you can pose your questions. Um, everybody in attendance um, from the public this evening does not is not able to speak. We have a high number of people, and so we're going to try to facilitate our questions and answers through this feature. So please, at any point, even now, if you have questions, um, feel free to start putting those in. Hopefully some of those will already be answered in the presentation by the time we get to that portion, um, but feel free to start putting those in and we'll go through in a sequential order and answer those. Um, you'll also notice there's a chat feature. If you have comments about the project, as opposed to questions that you'd like answered this evening, but comments just to be um, put on the record in relation to the project, this is an opportunity for you to put those in now. Uh, those will be recorded and included within the um, board package for the next time that this project goes to the board uh, as an attachment to the staff report. I'd also like to point out that if you want another formal way to pro propose um, comments to the board will also be by emailing parks at cvrd.bc.ca um, is the email address to um, provide correspondence. There's likely a number of you here this evening that have already provided comments about the project. Um, and so thank you for providing that input. I'm sure that some of the input or questions or comments that you have, have already put forward are gonna be reflected in the presentation. Uh, and those will also be included in the, as correspondence and attachment to the staff report that will go forward to the board at a later date. Um, but again, feel free to put comments in the chat function and uh, questions into the Q&A function on here. And, uh, and so following the presentation from Mr. Farquhar, we will, uh, we will go into that. Um, if I haven't missed anything, I hope I haven't, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Farquhar now to begin the presentation. Thank you, Chris, I'll just wait for the share to pop up. Thank you, I'll just uh, upload the presentation now. And thank you everybody for uh, taking your time out this evening to find out more about the Pinsel Trestle Gateway Project. Let's get my screen set up here. So 
So yes, uh, for uh, for the community of Shawnee Lake and for our regional trail and the Kinsel Trestle, uh, we have a project that is looking at a new staging area uh, to deal with the visitors to the Trestle and the Cowichan Valley Trail. So, so why a new staging area? Well, historically, um, with the Kinsel Trestle, uh, it's been a long-standing valued feature within the Shawnee Lake community. Uh, we know the community supported the rehabilitation of the project uh, leading up to its opening in July of 2011. It's a top destination feature of our uh, Cowichan Valley Trail experience. As noted, we had over 75,000 visitors back in 2014. Uh, but just last year, it's uh, dramatically risen over the years to over 186,000 visitors in, in 2021. The trestle is also a, a significant draw to the Cowichan for, for tourists, uh, which brings both uh, economic opportunities for, for our business community, as well as uh, providing a, a place for people to come and recreate and, and enjoy our wonderful uh, valley conditions and uh, experiences up here. So the Kinsel Trestle Gateway objectives uh, are looking to address several things. Uh, we have limitations on our existing parking lots at the uh, Kinsel Trestle on uh, Glen Eagles Road and off of Riverside Road right now. So we're wanting to look to an opportunity to establish parking uh, to accommodate the uh, current demands and near future demands of up to 100 vehicles. Uh, we have uh, major congestion parking conflicts uh, occurring on our rural residential roads, uh, in particular the Glen Eagles Road community. Uh, with respect to people coming to the, the Kinsel, and it's 12 months of the year now. As I noted, uh, the Kinsel Trestle uh, is a major uh, attraction to the North Shawnee Lake area, so it certainly uh, helps support our businesses in the Shawnee Lake Village area, and uh, as a recreation tourism generator, it's bringing people in, they're, they're spending time, they're spending money, and that's having value to our businesses. And we also wanna ensure that we can maintain a safe and positive visitor experience and low-cost recreation for Cowichan residents and families. So as I mentioned, a regional destination attraction context, uh, this map here showing up on your screen uh, shows that for the access to the Kinsel Trestle, uh, there are two ways. There's uh, from the north along Riverside Road, which is a long and windy uh, gravel road uh, that brings you all the way down to the Trestle on the north side. Also, we have direct access either through Cobble Hill or from Mill Bay, all the way up through the Shawnee Lake Village area, Renfrew Road, and as noted, uh, Taylor Park is in the vicinity of our Glen Eagles parking lots. So that is the major draw in terms of people coming. They're, they're typically coming to uh, to the Shawnigan Lake side, uh, much easier access to get there by way of the roads. So the, the project and, uh, and identification of Taylor Park. So as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at uh, a new parking area for up to 100 vehicles, uh, the up, upwards of a, an acre in size overall. Uh, would include an accessible pathway to connection to the Cowichan Valley Trail. Uh, we have direct access to Taylor Park off of Renfrew Road, uh, inclusive of a gate for closing after hours. Uh, we'd be looking to fully close the Glen Eagles parking lot. Uh, so basically taking all Kinsel Destin traffic off of the Glen Eagles Road to uh, access into the community. Uh, we were very successful in getting a CIRB grant from the province of $409,000. Uh, this was approved by the board back in November of 2020. Uh, the board approved two projects uh, to apply for at the time. The other was the uh, pickleball sport complex down at Cary Park. And what occurred was in the first round, uh, Cary Park was uh, very successful. Uh, they were approved funding to go forth with the pickleball courts. But at the time we were advised that uh, all funds had been distributed and there was no funding available for the Kinsel Gateway project. It was only recently that the CBRD was contacted again by the grant funding providers to advise that they had some additional funds to still make available. And if we could modify the project, which originally was for $850,000 because it included a public washroom building, uh, that they could see forth to putting some money forward. So we were very fortunate to get through the, to the program $459,000 for the project, but it does not include a public washroom. And as noted, uh, a public washroom is, is, is still of interest, but that would be in future, and we'd have to look at other, other means of funding that uh, over time. So the existing Kinsel Trestle in the Gowichan Valley Trail parking areas, uh, as I mentioned, we've got two. Uh, the current one on Glen Eagles Road holds about 35 vehicles. It's a 1.3 kilometer venture from there up to the Kinsel Trestle. 
There's limited capacity to expand because of the existing uh, Glen Eagles Road, uh, Road right of way. There's a gas pipeline. That's the big Fortis gas pipeline to the east. We've got the Cowichan Valley Trail there as well. And there's some storm drainage tension ponds managed by the ministry uh, just north of our parking lot. And, and all of that's located within the road right of way. So unfortunately, there's just not the ability to look at expanding uh, that existing parking in any meaningful way. Similarly, on the north side of the Kinsel, coming off of Riverside Road, uh, we've got a very small little parking area, primarily nose-in parking, uh, holds about 10 to 12 vehicles. And unfortunately, there's there's really no space there to, to expand uh, to any degree for, for any additional vehicles. And from there, it's about a 300 meter walk to get to the trestle uh, from that parking area. So as noted, uh, Glen Eagles Road, and I'm just gonna move my cursor on the screen. Here's the parking lot uh, area here within the MLT right of way. Uh, you can see there's the, the drainage uh, stormwater detention area for all the drainage coming in from the uh, Glen Eagles community and off the roads. There's the gas line uh, that runs within the corridor and the Couch and Valley Trail. And on the right, uh, actually a photo share with one of the residents uh, from uh, just this past weekend, uh, showing even on uh, days in February, on a nice day uh, that we're seeing a significant number of visitors to the Kinsel, far exceeding the capacity of our 35 uh, car parking lot. So uh, for the Glen Eagles parking lot, uh, as I mentioned, when people are, are coming and the parking lot's full, uh, they're actually parking on the adjoining roads uh, up and down Glen Eagles Road and some of the side streets as well. Unfortunately, these are uh, MOTI uh, rural roads. Typically they're no shoulders or minimal shoulders, uh, no curbs, no established parking. Uh, they're not designed built for the level of traffic and the parking demand that we have seen in recent years occurring at the Kinsel Trestle. Uh, this congestion uh, is causing access issues and uh, increasing concern with our, our residents there. We've got 80 plus homes in the area uh, on and along off of Glen Eagles Road. And we're finding that uh, more and more that the, the visitor demand is exceeding the parking capacity on busy days. And that's 12 months a year. Here's the existing access, uh, basically coming from the Shawnee Lake Village area. Uh, they're coming along Renfrew Road, up Glen Eagles Road. Here's our existing parking lot, but it's highlighted in that light purple we're getting cars parking on uh, all these little side streets as well as Glen Eagles Road through the community. And that's, uh, that's really causing some issues. And again, some pictures on the right there showing uh, parking exceeding the capacity of our parking lot uh, for the, for the Kinsel Trestle. The North uh, parking area, uh, this is off of Riverside Road, as I mentioned, uh, it's very informal, nose in parking, right basically within the, the right of way where the trail is uh, and the gravel road. Uh, it's a narrow gravel road, uh, maintained minimally by MOT, but uh, getting all the way back up to the um, Coke Salah Road area, it's about a 12 kilometer drive, and about half of that is on this narrow windier road. So one of the things that been, has been shared uh, and, and talked about is, you know, what, what's available along the, uh, the Cowichan Valley Trail in terms of parks um, managed by the CBRD or owned by the CBRD. Uh, in the Shawnee area. And this map on the right highlights that we've got uh, four parks in the vicinity. Our, our Kinsel South Park, uh, just over two hectares. Taylor Park, uh, just off of Renfrew Road. Uh, Trestle Estates Park, also on Renfrew Road on the south side. And West Shawnee Lake Park, uh, a provincial park, but it's a park that uh, has been managed by the CBRE since the early 2000s. So looking at these various park spaces, uh, the Kinsel South Park, was acquired by the CBRD back in 2018 uh, through a combination of purchase and donation. Uh, one of the key objectives of that acquisition was to retain the scenic backdrop to the Kinsel. You can see a lot of the, uh, the property or the park in the photo here off to, the, off to the right. And there's also the potential for additional viewpoints and picnicking over time to accommodate visitors. But there is no public access to this park. It's actually on the, on, it was a purchase by a property owner. It was basically the Northern portion of the property beyond the end of Glen Eagles Road. And on the photo on the right, uh, along the Western edge of the, of the park uh, is that forest gas pipeline as well that basically comes off of the Cowichan Valley Trail right of way before it crosses over Coxala River and then joins back up uh, in the right of way on the North side of the trestle. West Shawnee Lake Park, as I mentioned, the provincial park that the CBRD has been um, operating and managing since the early 2000s. Uh, they have quite a, a parking uh, area down there, two large parking lots, which can hold over 70, 75 cars. But uh, we're finding that that park now is uh, getting to capacity on busy days as well. 
It's also almost six kilometers or a 70 minute walk each way from the Kinsel Trestle. And the parking areas within the provincial park are actually on the on the lake side of West Shawnigan Lake Road. And to access the Cowichan Valley Trail, one has to go across the road and, and up the hill a ways to get onto the rail corridor before starting to head north towards the Kinsel Trestle. Trestle Estates Park uh, on Renfrew Road. Um, this is a, a very large park that was acquired in 2016 as a community amenity commitment uh, through a rezoning of the larger parcels. So look for, for zoning from a, a forestry zone to a, a comprehensive development zone. Uh, certainly, uh, there was a fill area identified, uh, and I'll show a few more slides about that, uh, that was noted for possible parking. But the issue in this area is it's about 50 feet above the Cowichan Valley Trail, and uh, there's real significant limitations in terms of trying to connect that area. It's also noted that the area is not much larger in size than the existing parking lot on Glen Eagles Road, and it's a uh, close proximity to a, to a house uh, that's built uh, right next on a, on a property. So a couple of photos here uh, from Google Earth. Uh, here is back in 2016 before uh, the lands were transferred uh, through the rezoning over to CBRD for park. You can see that fill area on the bottom left. Here's the Cowichan Valley Trail crossing Renfrew Road, and you can get a sense of the slope coming down uh, from up above. On the right, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, the house uh, that just recently was built on the private property right next door. Here's that fill area again in the park. Taylor Park. Taylor Park uh, is located uh, is, uh, just south of the existing Glenora Trails or the um, um, Glen Eagles parking lot. It was acquired back in 2004, also as a community management equipment of a, of a property rezoning that took place. And at the time, the applicant also requested and was uh, uh, granted approved by the board with as part of that rezoning process to name the park Taylor Park. It's, uh, as I said, about 300 meters south of the existing Glenora, or the, um, not Glenora, but the Glen Eagles parking lot. Uh, so about 1.6 kilometers from the trestle, which has direct access off of uh, Renfrew Road. Uh, you can see the panhandle into the park in this area here. Uh, primary area identified for parking adjacent to the Towson Valley Trail uh, is in this area here and can be done with, with an accessible pathway to link up with the main trail. So just overall, Taylor Park, uh, as I mentioned, here's uh, the Glen Eagles parking lot. Uh, here's Taylor Park. And looking at it from an access point in terms of the main traffic coming through and out to the Kinsel Trestle along Renfrew Road uh, has a direct access off of, off of Renfrew Road into, uh, into the park area. So the history of Taylor Park. It was originally part of a, a larger nine hectare uh, forestry zone parcel. Uh, and you can see in these series of uh, photos from Google Earth, uh, changes in the property uh, in the 90s. Uh, here you can see the large nine hectare parcel in this area here. By 1998, uh, they've been extensively cleared. Um, and you can see again, in 2002, here's the cleared area of that larger parcel, but you can also see uh, clearing in other areas, like in the area for uh, uh, the, the Trestle Estates on the Renfrew Road as well. So changes overall uh, were starting to happen in this area, including the larger parcel that uh, uh, Taylor Park was uh, derived from. So the acquisition summary for Taylor Park uh, just to be clear, it was part of a, a rezoning. So in 2002, the regional district received a, an application from the owner from the, of the larger nine hectare property with a request to rezone uh, the parcel from forestry to rural residential to allow for a subdivision to, into some rural residential lots. In 20, 2003, the owner actually amended the rezoning application and included uh, the offering of two hectares of uh, park, uh, along with a, a request to have it named Taylor Park if the rezoning was approved. The board subsequently considered and approved the rezoning in, in 2003. And then in 2004, the owner proceeded with a subdivision application uh, with the Ministry of Transportation, who's the approving authority in electoral areas, uh, under the new zoning. Um, and as part of that subdivision, included the transfer of the two hectare park area to the CBRD, which was uh, per the zoning approval. So the community many commitment uh, was completed with the subdivision. So I know there's been some, some questions and discussions out there um, uh, with respect to rezoning versus subdivision versus uh, donation versus the parkland cash uh, uh, or, or parkland dedication as regulated under the Local Government Act. So just for clarity, I've got a few slides here that just give some um, better understanding and uh, clarification around the differences between uh, a rezoning community mandated contribution 
uh, a donation and park dedication as part of a subdivision. So community amenity contributions, typically uh, referred to as CACs, are, are negotiated amenity contributions that are agreed to by a land developer and, and the local government as part of a rezoning process that's initiated by the land developer. Uh, land developers can be in the property bis uh, development business or it could be an individual who has uh, a one-off application they're wishing to, uh, to proceed with. As I mentioned earlier, both Taylor Park and Trestle Estates Park are not unique as parks acquired through land rezoning applications and approval processes. In fact, in Shawnigan uh, alone, there's been a number of parks over the years that through rezonings and through offerings of community and any contributions as part of a rezoning application uh, that were successful in terms of being approved by the board to rezone, uh, have seen all of these parks come to the come to the Shawnigan Lake Fold uh, as parks uh, within the community, including the Shawnigan Creek Nature Park, uh, Shawnigan West Arm Park, uh, a couple of the community forest parks, um, and uh, a strip of uh, parkland up around Cobble Hill Mountain. And it's not unique to Shawnigan Lake. Uh, within our other eight electoral areas over the years, I've also included numerous park acquisitions as community many contributions uh, through mutually agreeable, agreed negotiations between land developers and the regional district. So a community amenity contribution uh, versus a, an outright donation, there's, there's a fundamental difference between the two. And I know that uh, the, the two are used interchangeably. And I know that when we've seen applicants come to the door to the CBRD, they do talk about uh, donations as part of a um, rezoning. But at the end of the day, those are uh, a mutually agreed negotiation between a land developer and local government, which is tied to a rezoning process and outcome. So when, when there's an offering of land for park, as an example, attached to a rezoning, uh, that offering of land uh, only, only is derived if the rezoning is successful, AKA the board approves it. So, so the two are linked together. Separately uh, and, and different uh, are donations. And, and these are gifts that are freely given without expectation of compensation or obligation imposed upon the receiving party. So the receiving party in the case of the CBRD would be the regional district with somebody wanting to donate lands uh, for park. And we've had a number of parks separate from rezonings uh, as outright donations over the years come to the regional districts uh, for park in our electoral areas, as well as regional parks. But they're not part of a community, uh, a community and any contribution. Those are, those are totally separate and independent. There's also, uh, I think, some, some clarity re required around rezoning versus subdivision. Because I've heard uh, over time that the two being used interchangeably, but they are completely different. Rezoning, rezonings, rezoning applications are, are processes that uh, are requesting approval to amend or change allowable land uses as regulated by local government zoning bylaws. Subdivision application, on the other hand, is, is the process by which lands can be legally subdivided into multiply separately titled lots as governed by all various regulations, including uh, what's allowed under the zoning. Uh, the rezoning, rezonings are managed uh, in regional districts by, 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 by regional districts uh, for the electoral areas. However, in electoral areas, uh, subdivision applications are handled through the Ministry of Transportation or the approving officer in, in electoral areas. Within that process, uh, the CBRD can acquire parkland. Uh, that's governed under Section 510 of the Local Government Act. But that is uh, separate from an independent rezoning, um, commonly referred to as the 5% parkland dedication. Uh, there are certain criteria that trigger park dedication or park, parkland dedication under subdivision. Uh, it's when you have three or more new lots being created out of a, a parent parcel. So at the end of the day, you have four lots or more within a subdivision. And the smallest lot has to be two hectares in size or less. And those are uh, some of the key criteria that trigger uh, parkland dedication uh, under subdivision. But again, th that is separate from uh, independent from any community amenity contributions uh, that are negotiated through a rezoning process. In some cases, we see both happening. We still see uh, community many contributions coming through as part of rezoning, but at time of subdivision, the parkland dedication requirement also kicks in. So the existing site conditions at Taylor Park, uh, for the, anybody who's been out there of late, uh, you'll note that uh, the central area of the park is dominated by young stands of regenerative red alder. Uh, this goes back to the earlier slides I showed of uh, Clearing in, in the park area, which uh, before it became park uh, back in the late 1990s, um, around the periphery of the, of the park, there is mature second growth. And there's also an internal road that extends the length of the park from east to west. 
few more photos here. So uh, the photo on the left is showing uh, the panhandle access in from Renfrew Road. And on the right, uh, one of three streams within the park uh, that all come into the park from the, from the north boundary and merge towards the south, southwest. The CRD has just recently had an environmental review completed. Uh, the re review has noted that there is evidence of past logging and clearing, uh, which you certainly saw in the Google Earth uh, photos. Uh, there's been the internal access road building, and there's there's in excavated channels uh, which are directing drainage within the park area as well. Three streams, as I noted, uh, cross in the park from the north and all converge towards the southeast before exiting the park. Uh, and each one of those uh, streams is culverted under the internal road that's there. Uh, despite what I shared with the board last week, that uh, nothing had been uh, brought to our attention as of yet about wetlands, uh, this work is, that was done has identified two small wetlands actually in the park. Uh, there's a very small one isolated in the northwest corner, probably about 40, 50 feet wide by about 90 feet. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have an inlet or outlet, and it's, uh, it's been denoted as a skunk cabbage wetland. And there's another very small one in the southeast corner of the park, uh, in the kind of extending into the adjoining uh, property. Uh, the environmental review initial work has also identified the potential for fish habitat in the streams within the park. But with respect to the drainage, uh, I wanted to bring this slide up to, to show because I know that uh, there's been some comments out there that Taylor Park is the headwaters uh, for uh, the west arm of, of Shawnigan Lake. I just wanted to provide some clarity on that as well uh, by virtue of uh, general topography of the area and some of the identified water courses that uh, there's a much larger uh, watershed area uh, encircling the whole area inclusive of the Glen Eagles uh, subdivision area north of Taylor Park up to where some ponds are in this area and also into the Trestle Estates Park and beyond. Uh, this one little blue line here actually is uh, doesn't exist. It doesn't run right through an individual's house. Um, that is a part of another overlay. But the blue arrows generally give a sense of the overall direction of how drainage is occurring in the area. So within the Trestle Estates Park, all draining down, coming down to uh, Renfrew Road and then working its way under the Cowich Valley Trail, um, uh, heading out down towards the uh, West Arm uh, Park in Shawnigan before getting into the lake itself. And within the Glen Eagles community, uh, off, of, uh, off of the properties, coming down the network of little roads. Here's our existing staging area. There's a, there's a large couple of culverts under uh, the Cowish Valley Trail in this area, and we do know that the water is then uh, swinging back around and coming in, and it's likely that first little uh, tributary coming through Taylor Park before uh, joining up the other two down towards the end of the Panhandle. So the Kinsel Trestle Gateway Project, um, what, is it, what's, uh, what are we looking at here, uh, and why was Taylor Park uh, the focus of this um, application and, and the focus of, of this project? Well, the park is in close proximity to the existing parking lot. As noted earlier, it's got uh, direct access off of Renfrew Road, uh, the main arterial road out to uh, the west side of Shawnigan Lake in the north area, uh, avoiding the residential areas. Uh, the park master plan supports uh, the Cowich and Valley Trail, Kinsel Trestle Initiative, uh, the promotion of recreation tourism in the area, uh, but also notes that uh, you know, responding to use demands and the ability to adjust to meeting changing needs of the community. Important to clarify, this is the uh, Shawnee Lake Community Park Trails Master Plan that was prepared and adopted prior to the Kinsel Trestle project being finished and open to the public. So we also recognize that, uh, you know, the, the time has, uh, has gone uh, since that plan was adopted by the community, but it also noted that uh, there, you know, there would be need to respond to changing needs and changing issues in the community to to better address uh, the, the needs of the community and demands of the community. So a key thing of this project is addressing the impacts uh, within the Glen Eagles Road community. Uh, the, the Kinsel Trestle and the popularity of it as a destination, a major feature in the Cowichan uh, has caused on this community in terms of the amount of traffic coming in and not just a couple of months of the year, but coming in uh, year round. As part of the project, uh, we could, it's also looking at not just uh, the, the gateway elements, but also an opportunity to do some restoration work in, in the large area of the park that was impacted by some of those past uh, land clearing activities. So for the project next steps, uh, there's additional environmental mapping and assessment work to be done in the park to determine and guide uh, the parking lot footprint with appropriate setbacks from streams and the small wetlands that have been identified. 
Uh, hand in hand with that, uh, the engineering work will be done to complete detailed parking lot design and access road improvements and green drainage controls, which will follow the direction of the environmental assessment outcomes and regulations. Uh, the final layout design of the parking lot pathway connection and internal road improvements, inclusive environmental uh, requirements, we brought forward to the board for review and implementation. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to, to Chris uh, with respect to any questions or that uh, have come up as uh, I've done this presentation that we can endeavor to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, for the thorough, thoughtful presentation. Uh, I'm, go I'm happy to report there are a number of questions that have come in, so thank you to everybody who has submitted. Uh, we'll start with one from Jane, and that's what is the distance to walk from the parking lot to the trestle? And I believe, referring back to the presentation, it's about 1.6 kilometers. Is that correct, Brian? It's 1.3 kilometers from the existing parking lot to be 1.6 kilometers uh, from Taylor Park. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. Um, I have another question from Sue asking if it would be possible to have a few designated parking spots for horse trailers at the potential new site. We can certainly look at that and then and give some guidance to the, the design team to see how those could be factored into the overall layout. So uh, we can endeavor to do that. There was a very similar question from Tony, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to count that as an answer to his question as well. Um, a question from Kim that asks how this gravel parking lot on a narrow panhandle can, can be designed to accommodate future growth and withstand climate events, including unprecedented rainfall. That will be part of what we have the design team look into because we want to ensure that uh, what goes in can uh, and will respond to climate change elements. So I guess what you're saying is that would be determined um, at a future time pending the studies that would go into the project before it uh, actually broke ground if it was approved. That's correct. Okay, next question is from Kim and she's wondering how the grant money, um, which is about half of what was actually applied for, can be used now if the shovel ready criteria of the project was not met as it was supposed to start before uh, the end of 2021. So, um, to clarify, the original application was submitted in late 2020, and the province did the first round of approvals. And very fortunately uh, for Cary Park, uh, they were approved for the pickleball sport complex, uh, six courts down there. This project was not approved at that time. And so we were going on the premise that as the regional district, uh, we were successful in, in, uh, in getting one project approved for the program. It, it was only very recently uh, that we were reapproached by the grant program to advise that they had some additional dollars still to distribute. And could we look at modifying the project to not do the, the inclusive of the washroom building, but rather just to focus on the staging area being the, the, the parking and the access to the trail. And that's what the $479,000 is for, is strictly just for the parking and access to the trail does not include the washroom building that would have been part of the $850,000 project. And uh, so we're, we're, we're on schedule in terms of uh, when they announced to us uh, these funds being available, so. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, next question is from Lori, and she wonders if, or states the number of people visiting the trestle um, may be higher than usual because of the fact that COVID reduced the types of activities that can be done safely um, and that all of our parks were extremely busy. As restrictions lift, um, she believes the numbers may drop significantly and has this been taken into consideration? Yes, and the indicators to us are that uh, number one, uh, the popularity of the, of the Kinsel and the traffic volumes and excess uh, parking demand was pre-COVID. Certainly we saw a jump over the last couple of years, but our expectations, not just for the Kinsel Trestle, but for all our parks and spaces is that people are, have, have gotten out and they have discovered uh, these wonderful outdoor uh, places to use and enjoy across the Cowichan. And we don't anticipate that we're gonna see much of a drop because people are continuing to come back and use and enjoy these places. It's all about outdoor uh, experiences. It's about health and wellness. People's people's um, 
you know, lifestyles are changing. Uh, influenced by COVID to a degree, but uh, the flip side is people are really enjoying these these places they're getting out to, and we don't see that it's going to be be slowing down significantly, which is a good thing uh, overall because we want people out enjoying their parks and their trails, and uh, mental health, mental wellness are important these days. Thanks, Brad. I can also note in my role as the communications and engagement manager that uh, our website, the Kinsel Trestle page, is one of the highest traffic pages on our website. Um, so much so that even prior to my time here, four years ago, we created a specific uh, link uh, off of the home page directly to that page, recognizing how many people were interested uh, in that attraction in the region. So I certainly know it's uh, it's been popular for a while. Um, the next question is from Lori, and I, I think it's a pretty simple answer from a regional district perspective, but I'll still read it out here. Um, she's wondering if we can improve the Malahat Highway to two lanes all the way up to this area. Um, as increasing capacity to our parks, more people from Victoria will want to come up here, and it's already very busy. And I believe the answer is that that's outside of the jurisdiction of the regional district and is a Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure issue uh, entirely and probably has nothing to do with this project specifically. Is that fair to say? I would say that's a, a appropriate answer. Um, another another uh, suggestion here would be to increase the number of handicapped parking spaces in the parking lot nearest to the trestle, trestle for those that may not be able to walk 60 minutes to get there, um, whereas other able-bodied people can park further away. And I was serious. I, I think we'll take that as a uh, as more of a comment than an actual question. Um, a, in the in the event that we continue to use the existing parking lot for for the foreseeable future, um, the next one is from Brenda, where she asks. Some confusion regarding the amount of community amenity and donation, and I think this came before uh, or just as you were getting to that part of the presentation. Um, of the five acres proposed for the gateway project, can we confirm that the amount of community amenity being 1.7 acres with another 3.825 acres being donated um, from Mr. Taylor at a dollar value of $89,000? So for, for clarity, the entirety of that park space was covered as a community many contribution because it was all laid out in the proposal received by the regional district as part of the rezoning application to provide the two hectares uh, for a park as part of the rezoning. So it, it wasn't, uh, this little bit was gonna be part of a community many contribution. This little bit was part of a uh, section 510 of the uh, sub, uh, local government act for subdivision and the balance was a donation. The, the, all of it was covered off as a as a community amenity contribution as part of the rezoning application. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Brian. Um, the next uh, post in the Q and A is from Sean, and I think it's more of a comment. There's not an exact question in there, but he just wants to point out as a Glen Eagles resident that uh, the increased traffic of uh, in the neighborhood has continued to increase and uh, that something needs to be done about it um, in general. So we'll, John will note that as a, as a comment to the project. Thank you for submitting that. Um, the next question is from Roy who asks, uh, it appears the panhandle is only 10 meters wide. How will that handle the volume of traffic we are suggesting? So for the parking lot and for the access, the, the panhandle itself, uh, for two lanes, you only need about five or six meters. The traffic is going to be very slow going through there, and we don't anticipate there being issues in terms of the space that's there to facilitate the two-way traffic to get in and out of the parking area. And again, that will all be the detailed design work that uh, the team will take on when when they're doing the uh, the engineering layout for the parking lot and and the access improvements. Okay, um, the next question from Susan asking, will the environmental report be made public? Yes, uh, it'll, be, it'll all be part of the information that uh, will be available to the public, uh, along with the detailed design work that will be done and will also be coming forward to the board. Okay, the next question comes from Kim, um, stating that there's visible water damage to the entrance of the new Dugan Park lower uh, SLCC parking lot, um, evidence of water pooling there during heavy rainfall. Uh, again, how will the narrow panhandle access the support of heavy vehicle use and materials need to keep uh, it up after winter rains? 
don't know if that differs from the answer you just gave, Brian, at all. Again, it'll all be, it'll all be for the, uh, the engineering and the environmental team to work those details out. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Roy. As the owner of the land that all the runoff of water from Taylor, as the owner of the land that all the runoff of water from Taylor Park, how are you going to manage the water before it enters my land? I assume he means adjacent to and south of uh, the flow of water going through Taylor. Yeah, so, so overall, the, the three little water courses uh, that travel from north to southeast, uh, they, they join together. The area of Taylor Park is, is quite small relative to the, as you saw in the earlier slide, the larger drainage area that's uh, is basically where all of these little water courses are coming from and draining from. So the park area itself um, will have minimal change in terms of uh, additional drainage, and we'll be wanting to work with the environmental consultants in particular to see where there might be opportunities for enhancements or slowing of water or uh, the movements of water so that uh, at the end of the day, as it's exiting the park, um, other than the volume of water coming into the park in the first place, uh, we're not wanting to see much in the way of change. But uh, at the end of the day, if there's opportunities to do enhancement to, uh, for those little water courses in the park uh, that can add environmental value, uh, can add some value around water uh, flow controls or stability and stuff, we want to look at that stuff as well. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, the next uh, comment slash question from Jasmine. Um, I believe you've an we've answered kind of the generality of you know questions around environment um, and preservation of wetlands and things that are going to be answered um, through environmental assessment um, down the road. Uh, should it should it proceed? Um, but I think the the question that she poses at the end in terms of is there anything that CBRD plans to do in regards to carbon offsets for this project? We can certainly look at that, um, but it is a very small park. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the parking area is no more than one acre in, a, in a, almost a five acre park. So within the areas uh, in the park that were impacted by previous uh, land clearing activities, we can look at doing some replanting enhancement there. So that could certainly bring some value that way in terms of carbon offset, but more importantly, some environmental mitigation enhancement within the park in terms of bringing value back for wildlife and for uh, water quality, et cetera. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Mary and she asks, what community consultation occurred before this project was identified, decisions being made and funding acquired for it? Mm -hmm. that, that's a good question. As I mentioned uh, earlier on, um, we have the Community Parks Trails Master Plan for Shawnigan Lake. Uh, that was adopted uh, by the board prior to uh, the popularity of the Kinsel Trestles rehabilitation, reaching a point where we were seeing uh, the level and numbers of, of traffic showing up on Glen Eagles Road. We have been dialoguing with the Glen Eagles community in particular uh, over the issue of parking and uh, looking at um, opportunities and options to help address the impacts that they in particular have been uh, dealing with uh, with all the traffic coming in there. So part of the uh, part of the engagement is this meeting this evening to share with the community uh, this opportunity in terms of uh, the grant. As I mentioned earlier as well, um, the grant applications, um, as typical with the, with uh, the province uh, and with federal grants, uh, we barely get enough time to get a heads up from the board as to whether or not this is some, uh, an application that we could submit uh, on versus uh, the deadlines for the grant. So uh, unfortunately, as with this grant, with other grants, uh, there's not sort of that time frame built in to go out to the community about a particular grant before a grant application is made. And at the time, um, when Kerry Park got the, uh, the grant approved for the pickleball courts, uh, we were advised this project was not approved um, as, as staff and as uh, to the direction of the board in terms of priorities for 2021, um, priority shifted. Suddenly we were advised by the province that uh, they had funds available and uh, is to get some of the project done. So that's where we're at now. And that's why uh, we're able to share with the community the good news now about the grant program and about what's being proposed for Taylor Park. Thanks, Brian. The questions are coming in hot and heavy here. I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to get to them all in our allotted time. 
so I'm going to, if there's a question that comes in that's similar to something that's already been asked and I think answered, I'm going to peruse over it. Again, it will be included in the package that goes to the board. I just want to ensure that uh, the variety of questions gets to be asked and uh, responded to this evening. Um, we, the next one was about, oh geez, and as they come in, I sometimes lose my spot, apologies. Um, one of them was, ah, uh, the next one related to um, the, identify, the identifiable wetlands on the site and that uh, there's been noted that there's been some signs from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, with salmon at work and, uh, and other things identifying fish habitat posted. Um, has this work been documented or the work in terms of environmental assessment been documented and has the CVRD had our interaction with DFO um, at this point? So the CVRD has not had interaction with DFO. Uh, that will be the work to be done by the environmental consultants. Uh, I can advise you that staff were out in the park a week and a half ago and, and there weren't any signs posted. So uh, those are brand new signs in the park. We don't know where they came from or who put them up. Uh, they weren't put up by the regional district. Um, and we certainly weren't advised by DFO that they were gonna be in there posting any signs. So unfortunately I can't comment about uh, the nature of the signs or as to uh, why, they, why they're there suddenly, but um, uh, all the work that will be done by the environmental consultants will certainly involve the engagement with DFO. Thanks, Brian. Um, there's a question about the, um, the initial consultant um, that may have stated there was no wetlands or riparian areas in the park. Was there, was there any, was there work done by an external consultant to identify that or was that to the best of our knowledge internally? So it was the best of our knowledge that uh, nothing had come to us because we hadn't uh, had any, uh, we hadn't engaged any environmental consultants out in, out in the park until just this recent work. So the comments I made to the board last week were based on the information that I'd had to that point, which uh, we had not uh, uh, been advised of any uh, identified wetlands within the park. Uh, it was only when the consultants came back to us uh, earlier this week to say, yeah, actually there's, Two very very small wetlands. One in the northwest corner, which has uh, skunk cabbage. It's a, as I said, a self-contained little wetland. They, they figure it dries out in the summer. There's no real inlet or outlet. It's almost like a little uh, depression in the ground that uh, collects water during winter months. And there's another very small one in the southeast corner. So now now we know that there's some wetlands in the park, which is great. Okay. The next question is from Roy and asking, and there's there's been a similar question in terms of security of um, this this park and area going forward, and how would uh, would access be um, restricted for after hours access to ensure there's no overnight parking in the area? Yeah, no good question. We have a number of parks where we actually have installed a gate uh, right at the entrance. So in this particular case, we would install uh, have a gate installed uh, right off of Renfrew Road and uh, look to have it closed nightly. Uh, we do this at a number of our parks, and and that goes a long way to uh, dissuade any after hours use. So this is this is definitely a park that we'd be looking to put a gate in. Uh, there's another question, and I don't know if it's if there was. It, it's asking to report the screen that showed concerns with simply extending the existing parking lot, but maybe it's just worth mentioning if there what what the potential for existing the current parking lot is, um, if at all. So, so, so the existing park lot, can we make it, can we make it larger? Is that the question? I believe that's the essence of the question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so um, the only way you, one could, uh, um, so the east is the gas pipeline. That's the major forest gas pipeline. Um, going further south, uh, it's private property. And there's also the east-west access to a couple of properties uh, uh, to the east of the parking lot. You're right up against Glen Eagles Road on the west. And there's not the ability to go north because that's a large uh, stormwater detention pond area that the Ministry of Transportation has to deal with all of uh, the water and drainage coming off of the, the Glen Eagles community. So through the Ministry of Transportation, uh, they've advised us in the past that uh, the extent of where the parking lot sits right now is pretty much the footprint because there's not the ability to, to um, go forward or go, go any further north. So, Unfortunately, we're, you know, we're constrained in terms of boundaries to that uh, existing parking area uh, to any ability to expand in any meaningful way to accommodate additional vehicles. 
that's a good question. Okay, next question comes from Jasmine asking, have uh, any indigenous groups, including cows and tribes, been consulted with regards to the project or potential endangerment to um, fish bearing streams? Not, not as of yet, no. The, oh geez, here we go. Um, another question comes from, uh, I guess it's a statement saying park and community amenity are not commonly understood to be a uh, car park or parking lot. Um, and the definition of a park um, being used for recreation and wondering how many CBRD parks have been converted to parking lots or parking areas in the past. Well, it, it, it depends. I mean, a, a number of our parks have parking lots. Uh, we, uh, as a regional district, uh, we manage a number of parks in our electoral areas. Uh, electoral areas by their nature are rural. Uh, for the most part, the means and ways of people to get around in our uh, rural areas is by vehicle and uh, the ability for them to visit and enjoy and use these parks uh, require parking lots. And so this is looking at uh, an opportunity to deal with the demands and popularity of the Kinsel Trestle. Uh, by virtue of providing um, sufficient parking to deal with the, the use and enjoyment on, on the overall trail and, and the Kinsel Trestle. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Taylor Park is about five acres in size. Uh, the parking area itself is only looking at about uh, one acre, uh, as close as we can get it up next to the Cowichan Valley Trail, uh, leaving a large portion of the park, uh, not a parking lot, but uh, an area with opportunities to do uh, enhancement work, uh, maybe some little passive trails, opportunities for uh, environmental awareness and education as it relates to uh, stewardship that we can look at doing uh, on those little creek uh, courses that go through the park and, uh, and planting opportunities to, to further enhance uh, a large portion of the park. Thanks, Brian. You're painting a very nice mental picture for me of what could be. Um, the next question is, will there be any coordination with Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure to improve the conditions of Renfrew Road at the point of entry for this new parking area? Yeah, we'll definitely be working with them to, uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, entry exit, uh, you know, uh, meets their requirements. And uh, we also know that uh, at that location, there's, there's good sight lines, uh, both east and west. Uh, so we know that uh, for people coming in from in particular from the east, i.e. from the village area, it's just a right-hand turn. For people exiting, uh, it'll be a left-hand turn to head east. But there, again, good sight lines both ways, but we'll be working with uh, the ministry staff uh, through our, our engineering consultants to work those details out. Okay, uh, next question is asking, uh, will any reports that we have um, talking about why the current parking lot could not be extended um, be available to the public if there is anything of that nature? So the so it's it's not reports it's it's directives back from the Ministry of Transportation uh, in the past uh, we basically been, have been limited by them in terms of what initially was put in back in 2012 uh, that's when the existing parking lot went in and it, it dates back to that point in time where uh, that was uh, the available space that the Ministry uh, allowed the CBRD to put the existing parking lot in uh, but uh, no larger footprint because of the uh, the stormwater detention pond area that they manage uh, to, the, to the north of that for all that stormwater coming off of the, the road networks in that area. Okay, um, the, next, uh, the next question from Jane asking about, is there not sites for parking that would be closer? I believe we've already covered that uh, in the initial part of the presentation and um, making, there's been a couple of references to the walk being too far, but as you kind of explained, we're going from 1.3 kilometers to 1.6 potentially, which uh, isn't a dramatic increase in terms of how far people need to access the trail. So we're gonna just keep scrolling on through here. Um, a question from Bernard about um, toxins released from uh, vehicle tires, ensuring they don't enter the streams and wetlands. Again, that'll be something that will be covered in envir upcoming environmental assessments. So just proceed. Um, yeah. Somebody asks, is, is this plan and project the sure thing or could it still be canceled? Uh, I'm using her wording here, but uh, 
Brian, do you want to just explain the, the process for moving forward with the project? Well, the, the grant has been approved by the province and uh, the initial project, the application was approved by the board. So at, at this point in time, um, through through the uh, direction of the board, we're, we're going to be proceeding with doing the detailed work and just bringing that back to the board for their information and, and direction for implementation. Okay. Uh, a question, this is a good question, I think. Uh, will the zoning of Taylor Park need to be changed as a result of this project? No, uh, under the zoning bylaw for Shawnigan Lake, um, and, and the same applies for the other eight electoral areas, uh, parks are a permitted use in any zone. So whether it's uh, a park zone or a different zone, when the CBRD has a park uh, on, on a property, it, it, the, the zone that's in place uh, does not apply to the, to the use of the lands as park. It's a permitted use in any zone. Um, I believe I saw some other questions coming through that uh, had to do with uh, with facilities, including um, restrooms, um, either in that area or along the trail that may be added at a later date. Um, would there be so specifically in the question I'm looking at, would the porta potties that are in place remain at the current area of the parking lot, um, even if it's converted from the parking lot into something else? Um, in addition to any washrooms that would be at the, the new staging area parking lot? Yes, we, we would look to have them at both locations, yes. Um, so we're looking to have a bit, we're looking to probably leave a couple, at least a couple of picnic tables uh, at the existing uh, staging area for people to use as well. Um, so as, as you just suggested that the parking area would be only one acre of the current site, uh, is there anything to stop future expansion um, of you know the staging area parking area as or should demand increase in the future i think that's me one that we're going to have to um look to balance between um, the, not just the capacity of the park but also the capacity of the experience um you know how many people is it reasonable to think uh, to be on the trail at the kinsel trestle at any one time so so looking at a target of 100 vehicles, that, that's, a, that's a fair number uh, in terms of uh, people out there. And we know that uh, given the proximity, the distance, so there's a, there's a fair turnover. Uh, we've heard from uh, some in the community on Glen Eagles that uh, from their perspective, they've seen eight to 900 cars in a day on a very popular day. So we know people aren't coming to the Kinsel for the entire day. So uh, the experience is, you know, people are there for an hour, hour and a half. So there's definitely turnover. And that would be something that we would certainly be willing to encourage as well. Um, question from Susan. Would there have been an environmental report when the rezoning and subdivision applications were made back in the 2000s? I'm, uh, that would have been like 2001, 2002. I'm not aware of anything, but uh, that would be a, a question for planning. So I guess we can uh, we can we can seek to look into that I suppose. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from Jasmine. I don't know if we can answer this. Why would there be a large Fortis pipeline running through an area with known wetlands? So the the, the gas the Fortis uh, pipeline is actually within uh, the former CNR railway corridor, and it's the main it's the main gas pipeline on Vancouver Island. Uh, serves Greater Victoria, uh, and it runs all the way up uh, through Shawnigan on the rail on the rail corridor uh, from the south end of Shawnigan Lake uh, up around the Kinsel Trestle up into Glenora before diverting uh, on a different path. That that pipeline's been in since the I believe the early 90s, uh, and it serves uh, gas uh, on southern Vancouver Island for people who have natural gas in their homes and in businesses. So it's not uh, it's not in the wetlands per se. It's within the uh, it's pretty much right adjacent to the existing Cowichan Valley Trail within the former railway corridor. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, this is I think this is a really poignant question to ask. If the project exceeds the grant money received um, for the province, will it be the responsibility of the CBRD residents to fund overage and costs for the project? Uh, as with any grant program, uh, the grant provides a certain amount, and if a project uh, were to go over, then it would be up to the, the, the grant receiver, in this case the CBRD, to, to cover those costs. 
However, uh, when the CBRD has received grants uh, for other projects, uh, we've also had the ability to uh, adjust the project to stay within the budget funds through the grant program with the support of the grant provider. Or in other cases, uh, I would reference the recent pickleball court complex down in Cary Park. Uh, through the support of the board, uh, additional funds have been found to complete the project. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I don't know how much you touched on this now in the, in the presentation, thinking back, but the, the current parking lot, should this uh, project go forward, what would be the, the future use and look of that current parking area on Glen Eagles? Yeah, so part, part of the work we'd be looking at the consulting team to do would be to do uh, a bit of a mitig mitigation landscaping there. Uh, we've definitely seen an opportunity to do some um, uh, nature scaping, uh, some natural uh, planting, some screening, of, of uh, you know the Glen Eagles Road area from from the trail, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, think there's an opportunity for a, a few picnic tables. Uh, one of the things that we're not 100% certain on in terms of uh, a future washroom building is whether or not uh, within Taylor Park uh, that could be accommodated. So we'd certainly be wanting to keep the option open for the existing parking area to also accommodate a small washroom building if, if in fact uh, we couldn't accommodate it in Taylor Park. So. Part of the design work will be looking at uh, those features for the existing parking area, but at the end of the day, it's really about you know mitigating it, naturalizing it, uh, making it uh, you know public friendly in terms of some usable picnic area spaces. But for the most part, uh, you know, turning it away from uh, the view you have right now, which is of a parking lot. Brian, what if um, if any type of engagement um, with uh, in our indigenous neighbors? specifically Malahat First Nation might be done um, given that this uh, project would be within the traditional territory? Well, certainly, um, you know, as we've uh, done with First Nations uh, over the years, we uh, have been looking to establish a, a level of um, connection, a level of uh, dialogue uh, for individual uh, park projects or individual projects in CVRD. Uh, not every project is uh, one that uh, rises up to a level of engagement with with the local First Nations, whether it be Malahat or with uh, Cowichan and tribes. I know our relationship with uh, Malahat in particular is looking at uh, some ongoing opportunities around, for example, the boat launch relocation down in Mill Bay. Um, Malahat was also very supportive with the Cowichan Valley Trail Initiative when we did the connection over the top of of the Malahat, uh, because a portion of that trail is located on provincial crown lands that uh, were uh, part of the treaty settlement lands for Malahat. So uh, for this particular project, uh, given it's in an existing CVRD park, uh, it's quite small relative to uh, the size of the park and everything else. Uh, we can certainly uh, let Malahat know of the project taking place, but uh, to what degree they may wish to engage back on it, um, that would be up to them. Okay, thanks, Brian. And this question, I'm not sure if this is something that we even have an answer to, but I'm just going to pose it because it's uh, it's been asked a couple times in terms of um, and specific to this um, parkland um, uh, process in terms of the acquisition. But when when these types of um, of deals are made in terms of rezonings and things, is there typically tax receipts given to um, to the the applicant for a rezoning? Um, or a subdivision for their contribution to parkland. Um, the question is specific to, um, you know, the current, the previous uh, or the donor or the the applicant for this being given a tax receipt for a portion of the of the hectares that were that were uh, became the, to what is now Taylor Park. Yeah. And I, I would uh, I would respond back. Uh, it was about the time that I had uh, joined the regional district, and and things were a lot different back then in terms of how um, applications and rezonings were done. And I know over the years that I've been here, uh, the direction that uh, has come about in terms of how rezonings are looked at in terms of community contributions and uh, the, the exchange of values or reaching mutual um, uh, consensus between uh, an applicant and the regional district, uh, we haven't been issuing tax donation receipts because the virtue of uh, what has been um, provided has been through a community and contribution, which is looking at sort of an exchange of values between uh, what a rezoning provides a landowner versus a community amenity to, to the regional district. But 
again, uh, it was uh, two decades ago and circumstances, uh, I would suggest, were a lot different back then. Things have gotten a bit more um, uh, savvy and I would say a bit more uh, regulatory and a bit more focused in terms of the structure around how rezonings are done by the regional district versus uh, decades ago. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, we're, the, I've, I've never had this many questions come in and during one of these meetings. I'm just going to be honest with everybody that's in this room. It's a little bit challenging to kind of to and unwieldy to manage them. I'm trying my best. So if I if I skip something again, it's because I feel like we've covered it in the presentation to the best of our ability at this point, or it's been previously asked. Um, and so the next one from Mary uh, is um, asking if we. Could, it has not been adequately explained why the challenge of the alternative site referenced in the presentation that already has a large area of fill could not be viable, notwithstanding a challenging slope, any adverse environmental impact to existing natural spaces should be avoided as much as possible. Um, and that presenting a decision already made is not true consultation, it's just information. And so I guess I, I would just opine um, in my role as the uh, manager of communications and engagement that, that the purpose of this meeting is, is not true consultation with the community, I would say. This is very much on uh, the inform spectrum of engagement um, with us just presenting as much information as we possibly can about the project. Um, and you know, this is ultimately a decision for our board to be making as far as the future direction of this park. Um, and so at this point in time, you know, pending any future direction from the board to go out and do um, some more engagement with the community around the project, that's totally at the, at the purview of the board to make um, the next time that this project is presented to them. And so I hope that you are finding this, uh, this meeting informative in that way. Um, and again, the comments that you are that you're submitting are all going to be received and included as part of that information package that goes to the elected officials. Um, the next question from Sean, has the board been presented any conceptual drawings of the site layout and the entrance? And if so, is there more than one drawing to consider or does the lay of the land dictate the layout? So the, the only thing that was provided uh, with the original application was a very conceptual uh, drawing. It wasn't based on survey or any uh, detailed assessment of, of the park other than an understanding that uh, within the park area close to the Cowlitz Valley Trail, there was, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the previously cleared areas uh, that um, had the access road built through with culverts and stuff that uh, were accommodating to uh, an opportunity for parking. The detail work uh, is yet to be done and all that in detail work will be uh, brought forward as part of the uh, work done by the engineering consultants and the environmental consultants. Um, uh, in particular, being informed by the environmental assessment that uh, will help um, outline uh, areas available for parking versus areas that will be important to continue to um, uh, protect and enhance in terms of those uh, tributaries to the park and those two small wetlands. Okay. Boy, I'm really hoping for a question that can just go directly to our elected officials and give Brian a break here, but uh, hasn't come in quite yet. Um, Question from CC, how will neighboring properties be protected from dust, off-leash dogs, garbage, vandalism, wildfire, et cetera? That's, that's a lot in that question, but at the end of the day, the, the parking area, as I mentioned, uh, the objective is to have it as close to the Cowish Valley Trail where people are right now. Uh, in terms of dust, uh, we do put a, a dust suppression down on our access roads that are gravel and the speeds for vehicles will be very slow. So uh, turning up of dust will be at, uh, at minimal anyways. Uh, in terms of garbage uh, and wildfires, um, for garbage, uh, the expectation is when people are out enjoying our wonderful outdoor spaces that we have garbage receptacles and we have parks maintenance contractor uh, that will be out there helping to ensure that Anything that is uh, inadvertently tossed out a, uh, a window in a parking lot is picked up. Uh, in terms of wildfires, uh, that, that's a risk anywhere uh, in our region. And I know that uh, there, through the provincial program, there's uh, the wildfire uh, programs that are looking at how to uh, better fire smart uh, in communities. And so we've been able to do that in a few of our parks already through some funding through the province. And we're hopeful that, uh, that more funding and more support for that program will continue and we can look at other priority areas as well. But uh, wildfire risk, uh, you know, unfortunately, when people are living in, in rural communities, um, as we've seen across the province the last couple of years, um, 
um, we do appreciate those concerns and uh, the way we manage our park spaces in particular. Um, we're out there signing uh, no smoking, which you should be doing in our parks in the first place, uh, no fires, um, and making people aware that uh, during uh, higher fire risk uh, periods of the, the summer in particular, that people are being that more vigilant. Did you did you mention dust, Brian? I'm not sure if you. Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, so very very low speeds and uh, a dust suppressant as as may be required, which we do in some of our other parks. Okay. Oh, I like this question from Kim. Um, has a shuttle service been looked at or could be looked at um, as we consider accommodating cyclists and human powered transportation along the trail? Um, such as a shuttle from the village in Shawnigan, um, which would tie economic benefits back to businesses there um, and could be arranged to make access to this world-class destination in a rural area equal, friendlier, and sustainable. That's a great suggestion. I think that'd be something we'd love to follow up with our economic development division to see uh, you know, if there's uh, folks in the business community that might have an interest in starting something like that up. Um, this question, I think I know the answer, but uh, the total budget for the project, um, do we have a total budget number? We have $479,000 uh, of a grant funding. Do we have an estimate of a total budget for the project at this point? Uh, $479,000 is uh, what the grant is, and that's what we have to uh, focus the project on, because that's all the money that's approved for the project at this time. And the next question asking if we designate any additional funds for the project, which I assume we have not, and that would be something that would be decided at a later date. Yeah, that would be through the board. This question from Susan, would washrooms um, be flush toilets that would require septic fields? That would be something that uh, we'd be looking at. And certainly if it would uh, be flush toilets with septic fields, then all the appropriate uh, investigative work would have to be done to uh determine if the soils were appropriate and uh could it be done in a fashion that would not be impacting the surrounding environment it, it could be as well a vault pipe toilet which is uh would be pumped out as required uh, which we know that we've got those in some of our parks and i know other um, local government uh, parks uh in rural areas which don't have uh, let's say ability to connect to a sewer system or adequate septic field areas uh, also use pump out uh, facilities as well so there's, there's some options available and we'd be looking at all of them. Okay, the next question is very specific to this project, but I think I'm gonna pose it in a more broader sense. And that was, is there ever compensation considered for residents who are impacted by um, projects of this nature by the CBRD, whether it be parks or otherwise? Not that I'm aware of. Um, certainly, uh, I think that, uh, any any project, whether it's a park project, whether it's a neighbor's property under development, whether it's something happening down the street, uh, we live in communities that are, are ever changing. And I think that for particular places like uh, popular locations like Shawnigan Lake, uh, we're seeing that um, the interest in the community, the growth in the community, it, it's changing. And um, for uh, for people to be considering um, compensation uh, for things happening uh, on a property next to them, um, that would be something that uh, I think would also have to reflect back on the time when they went to, on their property to do something. Uh, would they be compensating uh, their neighbors for what they're doing? So, no, it's not something the CBRD uh, considers. Okay, and I think Susan uh, responded to my comment about questions getting posed to the elected officials, so she has directed this to the chair. Um, is it usual to go to the public with a project like this without a more fulsome report to the board first? Thank you, Susan. I think you heard that this came up. This has been, the grant came up all of a sudden, so we have, um, this has been proposed, it's been through the board, and now we have to, now we, it's come upon us and we have to do our best with what we have. Hence why we're having this meeting tonight. Okay. Will the new parking lot be wheelchair or stroller friendly to get to the trail grade? Yes. That is the goal. Okay. Um, 
I think the how seriously were other sites considered, um, such as Trestle Estate Park. Um, before this, I believe we've already kind of gone through that and asked. Um, has there been any talk about extending bus routes to the area? That's perhaps a question for the board chair, uh, because uh, I'm not aware of what transit has been looking at uh, of late in terms of uh, routes not, in the Shawnee Lake area. Not that we've heard of. No, this isn't something that we've discussed. Okay. Oh, we're running out. Of, we're running out of time for our one and a half hours here. But I'm gonna. I'm going now into the chat again. If you posed comments, they will be recorded. If there's questions in there, I'm gonna go through quickly and see if we. Uh, if there's anything that hasn't come up yet, um, I, this is a great one from Kate. Um, if the Glen Eagle parking lot is closed, how will you stop people from parking on the road? So for that one, we'll be working with the Ministry of Transportation, uh, who's the road authority and to uh, see what we can do in terms of uh, appropriate signage and direction to get people into the new parking area and uh, not be parking along the Glen Eagles Road. Because uh, the road right away is through the ministry, but they're aware of the project and uh, we'll be working further with them on that. Uh, there was a question about providing the slides from the meeting tonight. Um, I'll just reiterate that. The meeting's being recorded and that uh, the slide presentation will be a part of that recording um, posted to uh, the park section of our website and on our YouTube channel. So yes, um, as soon as uh, possibly by tomorrow in the late morning, we can have that uh, posted and available for you to review and share with uh, any neighbors, friends, colleagues that might be interested. Um, Brian, the, what are the broad stages, um, approval milestones, and timeline for the project moving forward? So, good question. So, um, we'll be looking at uh, retaining the consulting team uh, shortly, and their work ideally will be taking place over the next few months before we're able to bring uh, the detailed design work and environmental uh, assessments and uh, the approvals will be required with that uh, back to the board uh, later in the spring, early summer, with the notion that with the direction of the board to proceed with uh, construction, we'd be tendering for uh, commencement of the project uh, late summer, early fall. Um, the grant program itself, uh, we've got a deadline of uh, 2023, so we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, for the project, uh, we've got to stick with the guy. Uh, the, the timelines that the grant program provides uh, for us. So overall, we're uh, we're looking to uh, endeavor to complete the project by early next spring. Okay. Um, will conceptual drawings include expansion possibility um, for future demand? I I would say at this point in time, the the assessment will be looking at the suitable area for parking, but uh, we won't be. Uh, looking at beyond the 100 parking stalls at this time in any in any detail. Okay, uh, this looks to be like the last question that we have. Um, will parks uh, will the parks director? I believe they're referencing you, Brian, and CBRD board members visit the park location prior to making a decision. So as a, as a staff person, I've been out there, but I will look to our board chair. Thank you. Yeah, there was some discussion um, for the board members to have a look and go out there and see this particular site. So there could be, there could be opportunities for that for sure. Thank you, chair. Um, somebody late to the meeting asking if equestrians have been consulted. I'm assuming that I'm assuming it remains to be uh, equestrian friendly uh, at the trestle and along the trail. So the the trail is very equestrian friendly. Uh, we have many riders that are out there enjoying the trail. Uh, an earlier question was whether or not there would be accommodation for equestrian trailers, and that will be something that we will certainly be asking the uh, design consulting team to look at in terms of could those be accommodated at this particular parking lot. Okay. But no, no promises at this time. Yeah, many, many questions um, 
that I think will be answered. Um, should the project continue uh, on and get to, you know, with, with some environmental assessment work, further environmental assessment work um, and conceptual drawings and things that will be answered at a later date. Um, in terms of um, in terms of next steps uh, following this meeting, Brian, do you want to um, just elaborate on on what a timeline might look like for anybody who's interested to follow uh, the progress of this going forward? Yeah, so the so we're going to be uh, completing our um, request for proposals, uh, inviting uh, consulting teams, uh, in particular from across the Cowichan, but uh, you know typically they come from Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, the blend of environmental and the engineering uh, expertise that's required to look at the components of the project and do the environmental assessment and mapping and uh, provide the, the guidance and guidelines for how the parking areas could be the parking area can be laid out as well as improvements to the access road. And then the, the, the engineering team will then go in and do all the detail work to determine uh, what's going to be required to uh, design, build it and cost estimate. And once all of that work is done, and we have a, a basically a, a detailed uh, concept layout for it, uh, we'll be bringing that back to the board. I would hope that we'll be having that back. Uh, I would expect later this spring to stay on the overall schedule for the project. And then through, uh, through the further direction of the board, we would finalize uh, the, the designs and go to tender, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by mid late summer to see construction happening uh, by late summer fall. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Brian. Um, with that, uh, oh, I see something come in from Cliff Evans of Shawnigan Lake. I'm going to, he hasn't asked anything yet, so I'll let him have the last word here. Um, at the CVRD October 28th, 2020 board meeting, uh, the directors didn't even know where Taylor Park was, yet they voted on the project. Why did the, oh, sorry, I'm just paraphrasing here. Why, why was that the case? I would like, well, because um, we actually, we go with the staff report, we go with the mapping, um, we go with um, that where there's a lot of parks in other areas, the director of the area that we don't physically go and see. We go by this, the professional staff, and the parks commission of the area and the director don't often go into another director's area for parkland. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I think we're we we're at the 7:30 mark now. I I very much want to thank everyone who attended this evening for all the thoughtful questions, uh, a number of comments that have come in again that are all going to be recorded um and go to the board um the next time that this project uh, is presented uh, i want to thank our panelists for for joining us this evening and contributing to um to this meeting and uh and yes a very a very well packed meeting kept us on our toes certainly no i haven't worked that hard in one of these virtual meetings yet to date so thank you uh to our south end residents uh for your thoughtful engagement appreciate all the engagement that we do down in your area and your interest. Um, I'd like to thank again, you. Oh, sorry, Chair. I just I'd wanted like to before you. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. You finish. Oh, just I just wanted to I just wanted to reiterate. If there's any questions or comments that you think that anybody thinks of um, that come up between in the coming weeks, please direct them to um, parks at cvrd.bc.ca. Uh, would be the pertinent place to to direct those. Anything that hasn't been contributed so far. Um, and again, the recording of this session, which I find, uh, I'm sure everybody will find very informative who wasn't participating, will be uh, available on our website in multiple locations, as well as the CVRD YouTube channel and, uh, and posted to our social media accounts uh, as soon as it's ready as well. And I'd just like to as well thank um, our staff and thank all the participants that um, came out tonight because it's a very valuable for us to get all this information and great questions. And we're, we all know that our community is very special to us and we wanna make sure that it's dealt with appropriately. So thank you, everyone. Yes, extend my thanks as well to everyone taking the time this evening to come out and uh, listen to what I have to share about the project. Thank you. 
Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much again. Good night, thank you.